Okay, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for being here. Um, I want to start off um, just asking a question, quick show of hands. Um, who here has heard of Docker? So brilliant, that's, uh, that's most people. And um, who is currently using Docker? And who's currently using Docker in production? So uh, that's uh, interesting to see the hands gradually going, gradually going down as we get further towards, uh, towards live. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to start off with um, kind of a, a, a recap of some of the Docker concepts um, and then talk about how we, uh, how we use Docker with Perl. Um, so Docker itself is things to let you package an application with all its dependencies into a, a portable container. So similar to, uh, similar to a virtual machine, but much more lightweight. But essentially what you've got in a container is an operating system, your app, everything it needs to run in, in one self-contained uh, thing. So having that really simplifies uh, workflow, particularly in um, pushing things out from development to live. You can use the same, exactly the same containers for uh, your development environment and your production environment, uh, which means this sort of thing shouldn't happen. Because <coughs> if you're doing, if you're running exactly the same containers on your, uh, you know, on your dev workstation compared to the uh, production servers in the data center, then you can say, well, it works on my machine. Of course, it'll work in production. So Docker's built around, um, yeah? Same image, not same container. Yes, yeah, quite right, same image, you're right. Um, so start with some concepts. Um, you'll come across a Docker file. The Docker file is the, the set of instructions to build uh, an image. And what this is, is a um, here is part of extract of, uh, of an example Docker file. It's essentially the instruct. Uh, if you were going to tell somebody from a from an operating system, this is how to install my app. That's the uh, the set of instructions that you put in your in your Docker file. So these are just run through. Uh, you can put any you know command shell commands things like that. So for a Perl example, you're going to be using cpanm to install modules, uh, create users, and that sort of thing. Next thing you come across is layers. So layers in Docker uh, gives us a way of uh, reusing images uh, and having uh, inheritance. So you can build one image on top of another. So you might start with something like an image of Debian. You then might install a um, uh, build a new image that is a, uh, a Perl environment uh, that might have system libraries and things like that, that you might need for your CPA modules. On top of that, once you've got Perl installed, you can then build a, uh, an application image. Docker registry is a version controlled repository uh, of your images. So just like any kind of uh, source control system, you can, uh, from your development environment, you can push an image up to, you, up to the registry. Then from your staging and production environments, you can, uh, you can pull it down again. Volumes allow you to store persistent data outside of a, uh, outside of a container. Because containers themselves, once they're running, uh, are, not, uh, are not persistent. If you delete and recreate one, it will start from scratch uh, from what's in the image. So on your, on your Docker host, where you're actually running the container, you can mount volumes from uh, just regular file systems on that host and make them visible uh, in the container. It's almost a bit of a rite of passage of when you start using Docker and, let's say, you, you, you uh, use it for a database or something like that, put some data in there. 
all of a sudden you'll, you'll restart services and uh, recreate things and then think, where's all my data gone? And that's where you find out about volumes. And the last thing I'll cover on the, the intro is the uh, entry point. Uh, the entry point is the command that gets run when the container starts. So you start the container, uh, you can define the entry, define the entry point yourself when you build it. That's essentially the thing that runs. So typically you, ha you have one container per individual service. So you might have uh, an application, a database, a memcache and so on all the separate containers doing their own thing. So how does, how does Perl relate to this? How, how can we uh, successfully use containers with Perl? So the thing we'll generally want to, but want to be able to do is you've, you've got a Perl application that you've written and you want to make a container from it. And you want to have that application running when the container starts. Now, for our, for our purposes, uh, we make a lot of web applications. So our application is a, set, is a Perl module distribution that in it contains a PSGI file. Uh, and that's the thing that we, uh, we want to run. So within the application source tree, we include a Docker file. So all our applications are built using the, the kind of standard CPAN packaging format. Uh, we release to an internal uh, local CPAN uh, instance, uh, and obviously open source things released to the public CPAN. So typical uh, module layout, your make file, readme, lib, and so on. Within bin, uh, we have the PSGI file uh, so that it's, uh, it gets installed when the module's uh, installed. Uh, you'll notice two Docker files, uh, base and patch, uh, and a vendor directory. So I'll come on to the vendor directory a bit, a bit later. But why do we have two Docker files? So the first one, uh, Docker file base, builds the application from uh, a standard operating system image. Uh, in our case, uh, we use a, a layer based on Debian that we've already installed, the version of Perl that we want to use, and uh, various other dependencies. But when, so when we run Dockerfile Base, that installs the Perl application using CPAN-M uh, from, from CPAN, uh, which in turn installs all the dependencies. So we wait. We wait a bit more because we're using Catalyst. Now, you will very, very quickly get bored of this in, in that every time if you've got to uh, effectively do a complete reinstall from an operating system, every time you've made one little tweak to your, uh, your application, uh, this takes a long time. So the other Dockerfile uh, that we have, Dockerfile Patch, builds the application on top of the base image. So it's taking what you've already installed uh, and just um, adding on the, uh, the diffs. So this is much faster. Uh, what we can also do with a Dockerfile patch is instead of installing the application from CPAN, just provide it with a, a .tar.gz. So if you want to build a, a test container uh, of your a test image of your application, <laughs> Uh, maybe to put, on to, you know, to put onto staging before you decide to do a, a real release, uh, you can use that. Uh, it also installs the complete contents of the vendor directory. And um, the reason for this is it, if you've got a, like a CPAN module that you've patched and you've built your own local copy of that, your own tar.gz, and you just want to get that uh, installed, maybe to test out a bug fix before you submit it to the author or that kind of thing, uh, you can do that. So your dependency modules can have their own patches. So back to the concept of layers, uh, now gives us uh, something that looks like this. So at the bottom of the stack, um, uh, base OS layer, pin to a good co it's good to pin that to a specific version uh, so you don't want to accidentally upgrade if uh, upstream release uh, something new. On top of the OS, we build uh, a Perl image with a custom Perl 
uh, built from source um, rather than using the, uh, the system pearl. We tend to keep the system pearl for the operating system's use and a uh, custom pearl built in opt for, uh, for our use. And dependency modules, you know, libxml, png, jpeg modules, things like that are already installed. So first thing we, we'd build then is the, uh, the base layer, full install, install, then build the patch layer on top, and through using uh, Docker tags, we can, uh, we can promote our patch layer, then to latest, and then patch that and patch that, and so on. So entry point, what's the entry point do? runs the application uh, PSGI file uh, that you saw we already uh, provided. So where do we get an entry point from? We go to CPAN. So we've uh, released an entry point uh, that's a kind of very, very generic uh, entry point for running uh, PSGI applications onto CPAN. So if you add that module to your Matefile PL as a dependency, you will automatically get the, uh, the entry point scripts and there's some template Docker files uh, to look at in there as well. So how does this work for developers? So as I mentioned earlier, we're using exactly the same, uh, contain the, exactly the same images and containers for development and production. So how does a developer actually use that and, uh, and use that to write code? On your developer mach machine, check out local Git repos and the, uh, the entry point allows you to <laughs> inject those repos into the container and override the already installed code. So it looks something like this. So on your uh, development box, You've got, the, uh, you've got a running instance of the container. You've also got a file system uh, where you've checked out everything from Git. That goes into the container. Uh, you can then push modules into, uh, release things into CPAN, uh, and then they get pulled out when you do a, uh, do a rebuild. So the entry point script has some, some ways we, control, we can control it. So if, you, if you're using this entry point and you set uh, the um, dev mode environment variable, then various different things happen when you start it up. So it starts off by searching for volumes in opt local uh, star star lib. So you can have a project directory within that project directory, have all your modules, and for each, for each one it finds, it adds the uh, lib directory uh, to Perl 5 lib. So that means that your local code, your local checkout, is found by Perl first before the, uh, the modules that are actually installed in the container. So you get that override. Now, if you've added a new module, you may find that there's missing dependencies, and when you start your uh, container up, it won't run. So there's another environment variable uh, you can set uh, install depths. If this is set, then the entry point will run cpanm uh, on all modules it, uh, it finds at runtime. Obviously, you still need to actually rebuild the container to, uh, before you distribute uh, it some, to somewhere else, but for uh, development mode, this will get you set. The last thing it does, it uses plackup instead of uh, a web server like uh, Starman or Martian. Uh, if you haven't come across Martian, Martian is a, uh, an extension of uh, Starman that adds uh, a memory limiting uh, feature, so you can tell it to re automatically recycle processes when they've used a certain amount of RAM. Uh, but if you're running in dev mode, it just uses straight plaque up to give you a single uh, worker process that's easier to use when debugging or profiling. The last thing I'm going to talk about is Docker Compose. Uh, and Docker Compose exists because real-life systems are not just one container. 
they have a lot of moving parts. A typical application, uh, or application stack uh, may look like something like this. So we've got a proxy um, on top, we've got a customer web interface and an admin interface, uh, both running different UIs. They in turn talk to a Postgres database and a uh, Memcached for um, uh, temporary storage. And the Postgres database then has in turn it, its storage mounted as a, uh, as a volume for the outside. So that's a way that you can you know, fairly typically set up a, a web app using multiple containers. So the, conf the compose file describes the wiring and configuration uh, of that environment. So through compose, you can start and stop this, this entire stack uh, just, with, uh, just with a single command. Uh, it brings everything up and it, makes the, uh, it sets it up so all the containers can talk to each other. So compose file looks something like this, uh, defines services, uh, defines uh, volume mounts, and you can pass uh, environment variables in for configuration. Now, crucially, this isn't necessarily part of your um, application's uh, Perl module. You might be using that Perl module in multiple, uh, multiple stacks for different customers and things like that. So we've found that it's, it generally, generally makes more sense to put your uh, compose file in a, in a separate repository and then also have another repository for the, uh, the implementation. So what I mean here is I've got, uh, we've got two, uh, two Git repos, uh, the project, the product, and the implementation. So the product repo has got the master compose file that describes all of that wiring. Now what I might want to do is once I've, once I've built that, is use it for multiple customers. And those multiple customers each have their own implementation for their own configuration. So if we put that in a separate Git repository, we can have one of those for each, um, for each customer environment. So with that approach, we do end up with the same compose file uh, everywhere, dev, production, uh, and if we're in a, a multi-tented environment, uh, it's across there as well. It keeps the configuration in source control. And Docker provides uh, a function called Docker Secrets, which allows <coughs> um, parts of config, sensitive uh, parts of configuration, things like passwords, API keys, uh, and so on, to be stored in an encrypted format so that if somebody sees the raw data in that Git repository, unless they've got the key, they're not going to be able to see the values. So uh, just to recap then, the entry point and the, um, uh, and the template files, they're available on CPAN now. And some more information on our uh, uh, GitHub, which we're going to fill out with, uh, with sort of more documentation and uh, examples of this stuff. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, any questions? Yes. Um, I believe Docker Compose is kind of similar to Kubernetes. Can you kind of compare the two? Okay. Yeah, so uh, the question was do uh, Docker Compose uh, similar to uh, Kubernetes. Um, so Kubernetes is uh, becoming, if not already become, standard for uh, orchestration of, uh, of Docker containers. Uh, and it can do a lot more stuff in your, uh, in your infrastructure, like you know, automatically restarting things on another machine if you have um, uh, availability issues or failures uh, and things like that. Uh, Docker Compose, uh, I think that, that came out before Kubernetes, because Kubernetes was kind of a separate, separate project. Uh, and it's more, more file-based, more about here's one, particular, here's one particular instance. 
So I haven't really got into using Kubernetes much yet, so I can't really talk about you know, much of the detail around that. But it's, it's definitely becoming the standard. Red Hat are using it in uh, OpenShift. Um, and yeah, most of the other cloud providers, I know M Microsoft have standardized on uh, Kubernetes for Azure. Uh, Google are big users of it. They're the original developers, I think. Sorry, 10 second delay when? 10 second delay shutting down when you control speed your images. Um, and if you do, there's a rather interesting blog post I've written uh, on the TV library chat box that you might find interesting. Ah, brilliant, thank you. Okay, so the, the, yeah, the, the question was sometime uh, control seeing an image, uh, you can see a, a 10 second delay, and there's a blog post on the CV library tech blog that uh, tells you how to handle it. So thank you very much. Good. Cool, right, nothing else in that case. I believe it's time for lunch. <laughs>